Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the 8th Annual CS Talks. We're thrilled to see you all here today at 35 Hudson Yards. <coughs> I'd like to thank the, sh the sales team, Shari, Sabrina, Christopher, and Nicole, and Related for hosting us here today. When we think about Manhattan, and we think about all these unique neighborhoods, and all that it has to offer to the city and your clients, and then we think about the opportunity to create such an important Manhattan neighborhood from scratch, and then actually be able to watch that vision come to life. I'm so privileged to be part of this team, and I'm honored to introduce our speakers today, Mr. Jeff Blau, Mr. Greg Gachet, and Sherry Toback. Welcome to the past, the present, and the future of Hudson Yards. Thank you, Jody. Um, I don't know if that was the past, the present, and the future. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how that works. Um, so I've, I've put together a number of questions um, to ask uh, uh, Jeff and Greg. What I'm going to ask you all to do is hold your questions to the end. We will allow a Q&A session for a few minutes at the end of this. Um, so first, a little shameless plug, which I was told I'm allowed to say, we just hosted the Duke and Duchess of Sussex here at Hudson Yards for the past few days. Um, I was told they absolutely loved 35 Hudson Yards. So if it's good enough for them, it's certainly good enough for all of your buyers. So make sure that you bring them in as soon as you can. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to start. Um, you all know Jeff is the CEO of Related. Um, Greg Boucher is the Executive Vice President of Related, um, both of whom have been here forever. I too have been here for a really long time, um, still at Hudson Yards. So delighted to be here, delighted to have you all here today. And we will get started. So going to put on my glasses so I can actually see the questions. So the first question, Jeff, is for you. If you could take us back to the earliest days of our first introduction to Hudson Yards and how Related envisioned what is now this incredible neighborhood. How did Related win the bid to develop the area and what was our competition? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I just want to say uh, thank you everybody for coming and welcome you all to 35 Hudson Yards. It's always great to have people come and experience uh, what we've done here and, and see it and feel it firsthand. So thank you, thank you for coming. Um, so if I think back, uh, we're now 15 years ago, uh, we competed in the competition in an RFP uh, for the development rights of Hudson Yards. And you know, if I think back to that era, um, you know, we were kind of about to enter into another financial crisis and uh, we were bidding just as things were getting worse. And we were planning kind of what we would build here if, it was, if we were to be competitive and win. And uh, <clears throat> we were partners with News Corp, with Rupert Murdoch, in our bid. And uh, similar to Time Warner Center, we felt that if we had teamed up with a, a big corporate partner, it would add uh, credibility to our bid that it actually had done and happened. And so News Corp was our anchor. And as, as the bid went on and, and the economy got worse, um, we had made it through multiple rounds. And uh, we were at the final round of bidding. And I remember uh, we had an interview with the MTA on a Monday. And on a Sunday night, we got a call from uh, Rupert's team saying that they were out. And uh, they were supposed to come with us to this meeting on, on Monday morning. And um, you know, we showed up and, and had to say, well, we're still very interested, but our anchor tenant that we've been touting for the last year is no longer. Um, and they politely said, you know, thank you, but no thank you. Um, and uh, I don't know if people in the room know, but we actually were not the designated developer originally. Uh, there was another, I'll say not to be named, developer whose buildings are close to here, um, <laughs> who was selected. And, um, and, and, uh, we watched, I'd say, with, with envy uh, when that announcement was made, and uh, almost six, seven months went by, and they were negotiating a contract and, and so on. And, and then uh, we kind of kept updating our work just for the slight chance that uh, we would have another opportunity. And then I got a call um, on, a, on a Friday afternoon. I remember it as clear as day. It was like 5 o'clock on a Friday from the head of the MTA, and he said, look, this other situation doesn't seem like it's gonna happen, and if you guys could get down here 
and he meant like right now, um, and you know, stay through. Uh, I think we can get this done with you. And our member, uh, so Steve Ross, our chairman, uh, it was in China at the time. And I remember calling him and saying, you know, what do you think about this? Um, as the world was was getting worse and worse, and and uh, he said, I'll be on the next flight back. And we, we went over to uh, the MTA's office and basically didn't leave for a week and effectively signed the contract that was that was done. Um, and uh, we made it a little bit better for us, I remember. But, um, you know, look, it's, it's it, it uh, and then ultimately it was announced that, you know, we, we won and we're the designated developer. And so I think back, um, you know, and, and that was like March of 2000. Nine. Wow. Um, and so if you think about March 2009, I think Lehman Brothers filed bankruptcy in September 2009. So, you know, it was it was very exciting to be the designated developer and then we kind of said, you know, what did we just get ourselves into? <laughs> but actually, in hindsight, it was probably the best thing that had ever happened to us at Nuts and Yards because when we were originally designated and when the contract was was created, there were tons of time, you know, commitments, dates that we had to hit to open the first building and the second building. And the one thing that we got changed was that we would have time because we knew we were going into this recession. And so ultimately, we didn't have dates that we had to adhere to. And so we did go into, you know, a pretty bad recession. And we, as opposed to stopping, we actually used the time to rethink what Hudson Yards should be about and how to plan Hudson Yards and design Hudson Yards. And we took two plus years as we kind of made it through that, that recession um, doing just that. And I think the output of that product created a much better place than maybe we get it even gone into the bid with. And so I think it turned out, I don't know, I think it turned out pretty good. Um, and you know, if you ask about the vision, you know, it's interesting. Obviously, this was a pre-COVID vision, right? Um, but the vision actually played right into what COVID turned everybody's attention to, which was creating this incredible live workplace neighborhood that had the latest in technology and sustainability in the buildings um, and, and had safety, security, and cleanliness at top of mind. And then, so you think through what happened during COVID and what people wanted, people that committed to the city and, and you know, supported New York um, as we did, what they want. They wanted, um, you know, if they were gonna make this commitment to New York, uh, they wanted to feel safe, they wanted to feel secure, and they wanted to know their buildings were clean and the air that they breathe every day was clean. And, um, you know, their commute was maybe across the street um, and so all that turned out to really be something that was so impactful after. And I think, you know, even today, you know, a couple of years post, if you think through, um, you know, what's happening around the world and how kind of we wake up every day and think about, uh, you know, some of the horrific things that we've seen, you know, having the ability to have safety, security, cleanliness only becomes more and more important. Um, and so, um, it was a pre-COVID vision, but it was a vision that I think is, is today more relevant than ever before. And, you know, if you look at, uh, I know we're here to talk about residential, but as a, as a confirmation of what we're doing, if you look at the, the office buildings and the commercial tenants that we attracted here, right? <clears throat> we have today, um, I remember when we first started pitching office space at Hudson Yards, I would get, well, where, where is this Hudson Yards and why would I ever move my company there? Um, and, you know, today, you know, there's not a tenant in the market that doesn't come to Hudson Yards, at least to check it out. And we probably capture a big percentage of it, except that we don't have any space left. Today, as opposed to where is Hudson Yards and why would I ever move there, we achieved by far the highest rents in New York City, unquestionable, and we have no space available. Now those are two good data points, but my favorite, and I think the most important data point is our percentage of people across the entire campus here, and we have every private equity hedge fund, financial service tenant, technology tenant here, 
our, our people in seats every day is over 80%. 80%. The rest of New York City is somewhere between 55 and 60, depending on who you're asking. And so what's happened is people want to come here. People want, if you talk to the CEO, say, why is it that you're 80%? They'll say, because people love coming to the office. It's not that all the people here, you know, the CEO said, you have to come back. We said that, but not everybody has said that. Um, they want to be here because we've created this enclave, this special place um, that people feel comfortable coming to. And it's not that they have to go back to the office, they want to be back to the office. And I think that's really all plays to the residential atmosphere that we created as well. This is an enclave in a crazy world in New York City where people can feel safe, secure, and have every amenity, every luxury, every bit of customer service that they want. And so that's really, that was the vision of Hudson Yards, and you know, I think we've accomplished it. Thank you. Actually, I think you answered most of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> right, I gotta go. Um, so the next question is for Greg. Greg, can you tell us a bit about the incredible feat of engineering that went into building a platform over the existing railroad? Sure. Um, first of all, as you can see out the window, I mean, those trains are under us right now as well. So you probably all know that, but some people sort of forget that because you walk around the plaza, you forget that you're under, you're over at train tracks. And so when we came here, there was that was here, and we had to build over it, obviously. And so the first part is a design challenge, right? Design challenge is that that, that platform is actually the foundation for these super tall buildings, right? And so you have to design the buildings and the platform together means you need to know basically what you're building in this entire like, city, mini city uh, first, right? And so that was the first challenge. And then this is an active rail yard, right? So you couldn't just clear it off and then go, you know, build it. We had to take down three at a time. They let us, you know, MTA, Amtrak, it's a whole combination of people to negotiate with, take out three tracks at a time to then drive piles, right? And do that. And this is the kind of project which you can imagine this, well, all kinds of things go wrong, right? This could, this is like delay potential, you know, huge. But actually, it was essentially right on schedule, as far as I remember, which I always thought was really shocking in the trippy door construction design teams. Um, so we did this three at a time, drilled piles down there, built the platform, and then built all the buildings on top. So, but actually, before we did that, we were about to start that, the Amtrak said, wait a second, um, we want to build a gateway tunnel under that to go to New Jersey at some point. So can you do that first? So we were like, okay. So we dug up like that whole side, Right? They built the entire tunnel section underneath the tracks, then put the tracks down, then put the platform back on top, and then build the buildings on top. So it was actually, and it was a, looking back, it's kind of good, it makes you stressed out thinking about it, but it's a, it all works. <laughs> and so, um, and that's, that piece is in. So that piece of the gateway tunnel is in under us right now, ready to be connected to the rest. Um, the more fun things is that now we want lots of plantings, grass, and we want to get you know, a lot of plants in here. And guess what? Trains are hot. And so our engineer said, well, we're going to cook all the plants. Nothing will grow here. So we basically had to refrigerate the entire platform to allow, you know, so otherwise the heat would be too much coming up from the trains. In a, in so, a very sustainable yeah. way. Yeah, I'm talking about, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand. I mean, and, you know, just in, not about the platform, but there's so many parts of this. When you have a, if you build a whole mini neighborhood, you know, from scratch, and you control the whole thing, essentially, you do amazing things like our code impacts, which, you know, provides, it's a, that's a uh, co generation plant providing electricity and our own heat um, for campus and contributes to the, to the grid as well. So that was a part of our, our so many sort of green sustainable aspects of the project. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Next question for Jeff. Jeff, I actually remember the earliest days of meeting after meetings with the architects of 35 and 15. How did you first conceive of building both office towers, residential buildings, retail space, and cultural space? And also, on top of that, how did the introduction of the number seven cha train change the course of the development? So with, with regard to the seven, um, that was actually part of the, the RFP and a commitment that the MT made, MTA made early on. And so we knew that all of our planning was based on the premise that the, that the seven train would, would be done on time, um, which was a, a pretty big bet on government. Um, <laughs> because not only did we insist that that train 
be up there when we finished. Our tenants insisted that they weren't going to pay rent if the train wasn't there. And so, you know, we had a lot of pressure uh, to, to make that happen. And remarkably, it was really the only part of the MTA system that was delivered on time, on budget. So uh, we may have had a hand in that. Um, but it was, so, so th that was part of the premise. It really connected the far west side to the rest of New York City, and it became a huge selling point, certainly uh, um, for our commercial tenants. You know, when we thought about planning uh, Hudson Yards, uh, I, I guess there were, one, the vision that we talked about, that kind of lifestyle, live, work, play, and making sure that, you know, we always said, let's think about a day in the life of a person who lived here. Um, so you could go to Equinox in the morning and work out, you could have breakfast at Electric Lemon, um, you can go to your office, you can come back, take a nap, you know, do whatever you want, um, you know, watch games in, in the amenity rooms, uh, and so on. And so having all those amenities go to, the, go to the shed, having all those amenities as part of kind of life at Hudson Yards was important to the planning and why you had all these different pieces. The other thing, just from a practical perspective, is I remember one of the, many of the competing bids um, were all office or all residential which I, I ultimately thought could never work because you can't build you know, eight office buildings at the same time or eight residential buildings at the same time because the market can't absorb it. And so what would happen is you would wind up with a phased development with construction that went on for decades. And we felt that at the end of the day, the people, no one wants to move into a construction site. I mean, certainly you could move in if you thought it was over in three months, but you're not gonna move in if you think it's over in 10 years. And so we, we had to come up with a plan where buildings were built at the same time that weren't competing with each other. So in, a diff, in, a, in addition to being additive to kind of the lifestyle that we were looking to create, we knew we could actually build this all at once. And that's effectively what happened. Nobody really moved into a construction site. Um, and so that was, that was part of the vision and, and, and the plan. Great, okay. thank you. <clears throat> um, next. So this also, Jeff, is for you, and this is a question that I answer often, but I'd love to hear it from your, from your lips. Um, there are a limited number of super luxury buildings happening right now in New York, super tall luxury towers. What would you say um, separates 15 and 35 Hudson Yards from the rest of the pack? Look, there's a lot of good buildings in New York, none quite as good as ours, but there are a lot of good buildings <laughs> in New York. Um, you know, I think what we try to do is to focus on creating this incredible experience within the buildings. And so it goes from all aspects. There's no one single part, um, but certainly part of it, and a big part of it is, is the location and everything we just talked about that's not even the apartment, right? It's the everything around it. It's the views, it's the services, it's the amenities. Of course, we bring the best designers, the best interior finishes, um, but if you talk to people who live in the buildings, they will say the best part of the buildings, in addition to all the great physical things that we built, is our staff, our people, and the way we manage these buildings. And you know, we joke in, a, in the rental buildings, we basically joke that no one's going to move out because then they feel like they're cheating on the doorman. And <laughs> they're going to leave, right? And, and like, they're never going to do that. Um, and so that type of experience of, of customer service and relationship there's very few companies that are developers that also manage, own, and operate the buildings at the level that we do. And I think that makes a big difference, you know, whether it's help moving in, help moving out, taking care of your unit. If you're if you a tear buyer and you're not here, we manage the unit. So all those things, I think, provide kind of that personal touch that really differentiates, uh, in addition to kind of all the things that people now come to expect as the best in class physical amenities. And uh, don't forget the best dog care services. Dog <laughs> care services. Sure. And then like if you think about you know, 15 and 35, so again, we think about how do you bring that much to market at the same time? And so we built buildings that we think are truly different, right? They're different from a design aesthetic. They're different um, in terms of the amenities that are in the building. 35, really attached to Equinox Hotel, has all the services and amenities, uh, and it has uh, a club downstairs, so you have, uh, you have hotel services, you get room service up here, you get um, uh, uh, 
housekeeping services, and so and, you know, and be attached to the great you know Equinox Club that's here. So it depends what people want, um, and we've had different types of buyers in each of the buildings, and that was exactly the plan. So we weren't kind of one wasn't cannibalizing the other. We had something here that was different and made for every type of buyer that could that could show up. So this next question actually is for both of you. Um, what would you say is the biggest challenge so far that related and our partners have faced? And what are you most proud of in Hudson Yards? I mean, what challenge did we face? I mean, just think back over the last 10 years, um, you know, from recession to COVID to terrorist attacks, um, you know, it's been a, to, you know, whole groups of, of investor buyers disappearing, you know, the problem, you know, at the top end of the market when you have international buyers, it depends on whatever's happening around the world at a time. I mean, there were a time that everyone said, oh, all the, buy all the buyers are coming from China. Then all the buyers did come from China. Then they were coming from Russia. Then they weren't coming from Russia. Then they were coming from the Middle East. Then they weren't. So you have to build a product that can sustain kind of geopolitics because these buildings take a long time. They're planned before whatever the next event is and they have to be sustained throughout those cycles and those periods of uh, you know, differences that happen around the world. And so, again, we think that we built a product that does survive, and most importantly, I think it's a product that attracts New Yorkers first. Um, people want to live here. Um, and I think that if you, if you build a product that um, you know, works for New Yorkers first, then international buyers will come from wherever part of the world happens to be coming to New York at the time that you're selling. If I can just add on to that, that question asked me too, but um, I think it's a, the scale is just was challenging, right? And it never in the second did I, I'm sure Jeff or anyone else really think, can we do it? Of course we're gonna do it, it's like never a question, but thinking back, it's wow, it's, it, that was a lot to do. <laughs> and we had to raise a lot of money, we did a lot of engineering, and, and like Jeff said, we had every sort of challenge there was. And we actually had to create a whole neighborhood too. We had to change the public opinion. It really showed New Yorkers. We knew that this had to be for New Yorkers, right? We knew this couldn't just be, you know, for foreign buyers, this had to be New Yorkers first. And so that is a challenging thing. New Yorkers, they, they want innovation, they want arts and culture, they want all these things. And so creating, I remember halfway through construction, I'd be in a taxi and people would be like, what's that thing, Hudson Yards? And so Jeff was saying, like, when is it starting and where is it? And like, God, it's like, we're opening it next week. It's like the biggest project in the history of the country. <laughs> and so it took a while, despite our marketing dollars, to really form your verse. But then it was like a light switch. All of a sudden, boom. And then no longer was like, where is that? By Javits Center? Like, you know, now it's the highest priced rentals, luxury office in the city, right? People just think of it as that. It happened sort of overnight, boom, neighborhood. It's absolutely true. Okay, so one more before we go to the big one. Um, this is for you, Jeff. I know that you were instrumental in pursuing some of our most important office tenants. Can you give us an anecdote or two about any of the companies that moved to Hudson Yards from Midtown and the Financial District? I always think of that. Um, I mean, there's so many, so many stories that came with the tenants. I mean, really, the very first one was Coach. Um, and, um, you know, I think Coach. <clears throat> really kicked us off. They put us on the map. Um, Coach had their corporate headquarters uh, where 50 Hudson Yards is right now for, since the company was started. And, um, you know, we, we basically convinced them to be our anchor tenant in 10 Hudson Yards. And it, it, they were able to get it because they knew where Hudson Yards was since they were here. <laughs> that was different than most others. Um, and then, you know, slowly, you know, Coach was there. And then L'Oreal came, um, uh, well, Coach L'Oreal, SAP, um, and then consulting firms, BCG came and filled up 10, and that got us started. There were some great stores, so that filled up the first building. Um, then, you know, the second building, we made a deal with Wells Fargo and Facebook when Facebook was expanding. Um, and then we started to attract, you know, the top of the building. And there was a great Henry Kravitz story when KKR moved here. And uh, Henry's been a long mentor, friend of mine, and we were at a dinner together, and you know, he was just, we were just, we happened to be seated next to each other, and he was saying, what are you working on, what are you doing? And I was telling him about Hudson Yards, and uh, you know, all, all the exciting things that were happening, and then we, we left, and, and that was it. And 
Uh, I got a call the next day, Henry Brown was on the phone, okay, and it was weird because I just spoke, spoke to him all night, and he said, you know, how come you never asked if I wanted to go there? <laughs> and I said, well, Henry, would you like to come here? And he said, yeah. And so he came into the office and um, we gave him a whole tour and we used to have the sales office before the buildings were here, with incredible models. And he's like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And so, you know, from there, we kind of started to negotiate a deal. We put his uh, very tough negotiators on our team, on, on the team. And, um, and then we made the deal and he, he called me into uh, his board meeting where he had to present to the board. And uh, he, you know, they did a whole, I guess they had an investment memo and they went through the whole deal. And, um, and then he said, I guess they, there's a bunch of partners there and he, he was giving the pitch on this. I didn't even really have to do anything. And he said, um, you know, this isn't really for me. I mean, this was now, this is a long time ago. He's, and he said, this isn't really for me. I don't even know if I'm gonna be here by the time this thing opens. Um, but this is really for the future of this firm. And you know, he said, if I think back to kind of when we started KKR, you know, we were innovative, we were cutting edge, we were doing things that nobody else was ever doing. And this is that moment. This is that moment for the next generation to, to be a leader, to take the chance to come here, to be cutting edge, to be innovative. And, um, and then he said, so that's my opinion. I'm not gonna vote, it's up to you guys. <laughs> so, um, you kind of knew where it went from there. And um, obviously, you know, having KKR uh, be our anchor, they took the top of 30 Hudson Yards um, and, and move was a huge moment for us because of obviously the stature of, of KKR and having a tenant like that. Um, and, then it, and then it was like dominoes from there. I mean, really, the, the tenants really came after that. Um, you know, whether it was BlackRock and Larry Fink, uh, Dan Loeb and, or Steve Cohn, or you can go down the list of kind of all these incredible hedge funds and private equity firms. Um, and then, you know, the great news, you know, KKR, not only did they come here and occupy their space, they then expanded and took twice as much space. Um, so, you know, those, those are great testaments to everything that we created here because first they had to take the leap to come here, but then they had to like it so much that they wanted to take more. So um, we've, we've had a lot of those, a lot of those moments. And you know, I, I'd say, again, like as a testament to what we've done here in this period of time post COVID where everybody says, you know, offices are dead, but we have leased more space in the last 12 months than almost any other time in our history, right? Compared to the rest of New York City that is up, that is down, down, down in terms of leasing occupancy and trends. And so what it basically reinforces if you create this incredible product that people want to be here. And that data, that one piece of data about people coming back to the office is the most powerful piece of data that we have. Then people will pay, people will pay a premium. And it's the same, it's the same with the residences, right? People will pay a premium for quality, luxury, services, amenities, safety, and security. And that's what Hudson Yards is all about. And then it is too, very clear. Um, so um, I'm going to approach the elephant in the room here. So um, we've all heard the rumors, we've all read the stories. Can you give us some insight, Jeff, into what will be the Western Yards? Well, you're looking at it. <laughs> um, so I, again, it's, it's no secret. Um, you know, we've been planning the Western Yards since the day we started the Eastern Yards, um, and it's changed no fewer than probably 20 times since the beginning. Um, and you know, as we got through the, we finished up the Eastern Rail Yards and, and started to focus our attention there. You know, we went, we ran into some issues of interest rates and recessions and all that. Um, and we thought about what actually could make sense here, and what could we do to actually elevate everything that we've done at Hudson Yards. And you know, while we were having those thoughts, the state announced that they were going to issue three gaming licenses uh, for downstate New York, and so. We thought long and hard about the, should we pursue a license? Where would we put it? Should it go to Hudson Yards? You know, what would the response be from our residences, our commercial tenants, and the future of Hudson Yards? Um, you know, people, you know, when you just think, I'm not a big, I don't gamble at all, so I'm not the right person to say whether uh, people would like gaming or 
up, but when you think about, when you hear a casino, that's not exactly the first thing. Why would I want to live next to you know, a casino, right? And that sounds kind of crazy. And so I said, well, why don't we think about casinos that are around the world and not like put our, our brain into Las Vegas, right? And so think about Monaco and some of the incredible uh, resorts that were created out of gaming houses. And so we went and interviewed residents, residents and our office tenants and said, what do you think about this? Um, you know, do you think this would be additive to Hudson Yards? And if we were gonna do it, it would have to be done at the absolute highest level, like something that has never been done in North America before. Um, and so we interviewed no less than 30 kind of operators who we could partner with, uh, who could come in and do kind of what we're envisioning to create, which is a world-class resort like never built before in anywhere in North America. And so ultimately, we partnered up uh, after hearing kind of the resident response and, and speaking to our commercial tenants. Uh, we partnered up with Wind Resorts and we designed something that doesn't look anything like exists in Las Vegas or anywhere else in the world, really. And it will be, you know, a gaming resort. Uh, the building will be tremendous. It'll be a three million square foot building as big as some of these towers, um, the gaming piece will actually be only 250,000 feet. So what is this building? This is a building with 15 restaurants, nightclub, bar, entertainment, theater, hotel rooms, Skytop uh, private club, um, Skytop gaming, in kind of the most incredibly architecturally designed building we've ever built on the Western Valley Yards. Um, but what, what that does, again, we can't just build one building, right? It kicks off the entire Western Rail Yards. And so what is the what is the vision for the Western Rail Yards? Well, this was the commercial core. And we have a, you know, a, a beautiful, but hardscape plaza here. And so the vision for the Western Yards is actually to build this incredible park. And so um, while the, the gaming resort will be, will enter on 33rd Street, um, on this side, we'll have a new, uh, a new office building and a new residential building that will have for sale uh, residences at the top, rentals in the middle. Uh, and this incredible six acre park in between those three buildings. And it'll be landscaped and grass and you know dog runs, one of the amenities that everybody says, well, how do you guys have a dog run? So we said, okay, let's build a dog run. And playgrounds and all sorts of things that are just not, that doesn't, it doesn't exist on the Eastern Rail Yards. It'll tie into the High Line, so you'll be able to access through the gardens and grass and this incredible landscaping, direct onto the High Line, there'll be a path uh, down to the other side of the High Line and across to Hudson River Park. And so we really do think we're gonna do something, there's no signage on the outside of the building, the same safety, security, cleanliness measures that exist here today will obviously apply there. I don't know if anyone's ever been to a casino, but there's more security in a casino per person than anywhere else. And so when you think about safety and security, this will be the safest place in New York City. It already is, but bringing that here and bringing kind of that entertainment and nightlife and restaurants, I think will really be additive. And so we're super excited. Um, we, uh, our bids are due in January-ish, we think. Um, and it's probably a year or so um, until selection is made, and then probably three plus years, three to four years from there. So it's probably five years away um, from, from opening, but it, it's something that will change New York, um, and I think it's something that will be incredibly exciting for Hudson Yards. And profitable for our buyers as well. So we ran a little bit over. I'm gonna open the room for questions for about five minutes, and then we have to let these gentlemen go. So if anybody has a question, please um, let us know. Yes. I think it's all the things we talked about, right? The, the epitome of luxury, um, cleanliness, safety, security. But really, when you think about you know, New York, this is really kind of the new New York, right? It's the future, it's innovation, it's sustainability, cleanliness, safety, security. 
security, all those things. Um, you know, I think, uh, as I said, we, we had this vision pre-COVID, pre all these events that have happened in the world. And I think, you know, today, um, you know, it's, it, it is ranked true. And so uh, I think it's, it is more relevant now in a post-COVID world than, it, than it's ever been. Thank you. Go ahead. I have a couple of questions actually. One was regarding the, um, I think you have an anchor tenant in the uh, shopping area, the Neiman Marcus that, that left. That was pretty sad. And then also, are you going to, are any of these buildings going to block some of the views of the current? Um, so on, on Neiman Marcus, there was an announcement in the paper that we cannot confirm or deny. Um, so I'll just, <laughs> just uh, direct you to the newspaper. Uh, but there will be some exciting news coming out of the retail, the top of the retail space, the form and needed space. And no, as um, cutting edge as we like to be from an engineering technology standpoint, we have not been able to figure out how to build a building that doesn't block, that you can actually see through. Um, and so, um, as was always the, the plan here, uh, there will be buildings here, and uh, they will block some views. Um, you know, we actually redesigned, part of this redesign, uh, for the Western Rail Yards. We had six buildings originally approved there, um, and now we've moved that to three buildings. And so we've decreased kind of the blockage and opened up that park, that six acre park, uh, opened up the view corridors much greater than what was originally anticipated. So we do very much keep in mind when we locate buildings, how to minimize the impact, um, but buildings, you know, buildings are not transparent. To, or to say a different way, I mean, there will be buildings in the view, right? They're, they're not blocked. There's not like a brick wall in front of your window. But like, there will be beautiful buildings that are the best architecture in the world that, that you will see. You know? Right. And we've actually, the distances are greater than any other street you know, system in the city between buildings here. So where you would have you know, a, a building on one side of the street and, and then on, across the street. <clears throat> that did, those distances are much, much wider with much more open space around. So, as Greg said, you're not, well, there's no blocked view, yeah. right? It's part of the view. And we've done virtual reality studies, actually, where you put on the headset and we put them in, and it's like a building in your view. It's not like in your face, which right. you get from a 2D, you surrender, you try to render a situation, but in the real world, it actually is no problem. And is this just a lottery thing that we've, or is there a, is it, is it definite that the uh, casinos will come in? Is it definite now the casino's coming in, or because I heard there was a lottery or something, they're trying to pick different? It's definite that there will be three licenses issued. They have not, they have not selected where those licenses will be granted yet. Okay, we have time for one more. I just want to ask you, what are you doing in terms of accommodations for the future of PV? Um, the future of PV? Yep. So, so uh, I mean, we are, I, mean, I can tell you a whole long story about our uh, sustainability efforts, but. Okay. Um, we are here kind of on the cutting edge of sustainability in terms of the buildings, in terms of bringing renewable energy into the buildings. All the buildings on the Western Rail Yards will be all electric. So those will be the first all electric buildings in New York City. They will all have EV charging. We actually have it already today. Greg spent a lot of time on this. Um, so all the parking facilities here already have EV charging, but they certainly will be part of the next phase as well. That's it. Anybody else? Okay, so I want to thank both of you very much for this. Thank you. We will still be here for another few minutes. The team and I, if you have any.